So this is a student project, um, but I'll give a short introduction. Um, so when you think about Lustre, you normally think of uh, uh, supercomputers and massively parallel expensive uh, hardware. Um, there's uh, new paradigms for using Lustre that have appeared. For example, AWS uses sells a Luster as a service uh, product, and uh, in this, um, they use S3 as the storage, and data is moved to uh, ephemeral EC2 instances. So it's an, a new way to use uh, Luster. Um, this is a scratch storage, um, and uh, when you're done processing the data, you can just tear it all down. Um, uh, some time ago, I talked to some uh, friends of mine who work at Lincoln Labs, uh, some engineers, and uh, they told me their process for how they use Lustre. Uh, they have a supercomputer, um, and they told me a few things. One, they said that uh, they tend to work on multiple projects at a time with uh, many different scientists, so the hardware is being used by uh, different uh, people, and, and, it takes, and they have to share it. Uh, another thing is they have to iterate a lot on uh, these pipelines to uh, convert the data into information and uh, results. So this got around to the idea of uh, maybe you could do this long iteration process somewhere else, maybe not on the expensive hardware, um, and enter cloud-native uh, computing if you could do it. Um, maybe you could speed up the process of um, uh, uh, it, this iteration process and uh, that's really the use case for using Kubernetes. I should point out that uh, it's for iterating, it's not necessarily for uh, performance because ultimately you really do need a supercomputer for a lot of these uh, cases. So with that said, I'll turn it over to the students who did it for their uh, final semester project. So we'll take a look at the current scenario. So right now, um, so if a system administrator has to set up Luster, they have to manually do it and uh, so through manually modify the kernel packages, which is kind of complicated. And it's really difficult to add, uh, add nodes on the fly. As Dan said, there's one solution that is AWS FSx, but we believe that, we, that would result in vendor lock-in. So we decided to automate this process. We created some YAML scripts which would help set up Luster automatically on Kubernetes. Uh, we, we also provided support to add or remove Luster, no, uh, Luster nodes. Since, it was, since we are graduate students, as a part of our project, we had the stretch goal of automating this Luster bootstrapping configuration, scaling and tolerance to node failure on Kubernetes infrastructure. So let's talk about Luster a little bit. So Luster has four basic components, MGS, MDS, OSS, and client. MGS uh, is the registry for all the active servers and clients. Uh, MDS is kind of the, it provides the namespace for the Luster file system, and OSS is how you uh, store your data. Client is the way to interact with the Luster file system. So for this project, the basic Kubernetes components we consider would be involved as our containers and pods, and I believe everybody would be familiar with that. For Kubernetes, first of all, persistent storage in Kubernetes, we used PV and, PV and PVC. So this, so this is our architecture. We set this architecture up on MOC, that is, that was provided to us by Northeastern University. So MGS, MDS, and OSS are managed in separate containers. The whole setup was was done using YAML configuration files, which my project partner would talk talk about. So this, so we use this architecture because of its ease uh, of bootstrapping, scaling, and node failure. So when we were trying to set up that architecture, we realized that Luster needs Luster needs kernel Luster needs kernel patching, and that so that was an issue because uh, Luster needs. So for that, so for solving that issue, we use Kubert, and what Kubert does is it allows use, uh, running VMs in Kubernetes in Kubernetes clusters. It uses a Docker image to spin up a virtual machine. We use Kubernetes secrets for, sto for storing our Kubeboard startup script. Uh, to spin off the VM, uh, we needed a Docker image. 
uh, which had the VM baked in. So we initially tried to create a Docker image with the ISO, but then uh, the Docker file was a pretty, uh, the Docker image was pretty big. It was on a 4 GB, and uploading it to Docker Hub was not uh, efficient. So we found the QCow2 uh, format for the CentOS image, and uh, we used Word install to boot up the VM. So we had to patch the kernel. Uh, so basically, we uh, used Word install, booted the VM, uh, created the Lustre server image and the Lustre client image, then added to Docker file, and we uploaded to Docker Hub. Uh, so this was a basic architecture uh, which my teammate went through, and this is the basic configuration file uh, for spinning of a VM. Uh, in this case, uh, we are talking about a single MDS server. So I'll explain a few components which are important. Uh, the first one is we are using the Qbert API to spin off the virtual machine instance on uh, Kubernetes. Uh, and we are specifying the kind here as virtual machine instance. That means uh, we'll get a virtual machine uh, on the cloud. And uh, we are specifying the host name as Luster MDS uh, for this uh, YAML configuration. And uh, we are using default Luster as the domain name uh, for name resolution. And uh, one more important, uh, these are three different disks uh, in, uh, attached to the configuration file. So one important one is the container disk, which has the Docker image, which we previously created. Uh, this specifies that we are using the Luster server image. And when you uh, VM boots up, uh, it'll have the Luster server modules already baked in. And the other two claims, uh, one is the persistent volume claim, uh, is the persistent storage for the MDS server. And the secrets, which have the startup script to enable uh, Luster modules and bootstrap the process. Uh, so these are the basic steps which we followed. Uh, the prerequisite is to have the kubectl, that's nothing but the Kubernetes interface enabled, and the Kubernetes cluster set up. And then we create the secret, which has the startup script enabled. Uh, then next we have, uh, we create the persistent volume and the persistent volume claim for the persistent storage. And then we spin off the VM uh, by using the YAML configuration, which we went through previously and we can display the status of the virtual uh, machine uh, using get VMIs command. So let me go through a small demo. So uh, here we have our GitHub repository, and uh, we can just see the startup scripts and the YAML configuration. We initially uh, create the secret uh, from the startup script file. Here we are just showing the MGS. Similar steps will be followed for the other components. And as you can see, uh, the secrets was created, and you can view it by get secrets command. So let me move forward to the next steps. Okay, uh, here uh, we have separated all the file configurations in different files uh, for the ease of use but eventually we can combine it into a single configuration file. Uh, here we have different files for MGS, MDS, and OSS. And uh, we have persistent volume and the claim for it and the configuration for booting the VM. So let me move forward uh, by creating the persistent volume. So I am using kubectl create and you are creating the persistent volume initially for MGS. And uh, that, that got created. And I can view this by kubectl get uh, pv command. So let me go ahead and show you that. And you can see that I created a, a 50 GB capacity of the persistent volume. Uh, it's a local storage on a particular node. So the next step would be to claim the storage and attach it to the MGS server. That's what I'll do next. So let me go ahead and show you that. Let me move a little forward. Yeah, so I created the persistent volume uh, claim, and I can show you the status of that by using get PVC, and you can see the claim was created, and we have utilized the 50 GB storage. And for the next part, uh, let's go ahead with creating the CentOS uh, VM, uh, that is nothing but the Luster MGS component on Kubernetes. Uh, we use the same uh, configuration file, which uh, I spoke about before, and uh, the VM is, uh, has been created. We can use uh, the get VMIs command to see the status of the virtual machine. So I will eventually get to that. Yep, there we go. So you can see the, uh, we can see the VM, Luster MGS, that's been scheduled. So it takes a while to spin up, but it has its own IP. It has its own node name. 
so we'll move on to the next step to see what steps uh, it took to create the VM. You can see there are multiple components uh, that uh, KubeWord used to spin up a VM. But the main uh, log we'll see is what image it used. So we can see that it used the CentOS server image, which we created to spin off the CentOS VM on Kubernetes. And uh, after this, uh, we can move on to creating the other components similarly. So I've created previously all other components. So we have two clients, one MDS, one MGS, and one OSS. Uh, I'll SSH onto a client to interact with the Luster file system. So I took the IP, uh, and the startup script enables the SSH key access. We have copied the SSH key, so we can ease, uh, SSH onto the client. So let me list the file system. We have named it Luster FS, and you can see uh, the Luster FS, and I'll uh, compare it with the local file system. You can see that uh, the source of the Luster file system is the MGS server, as compared to a local disk uh, to a local file system. In this case, it's a root file system. So let me try to use this file system. Before that, uh, we'll see the status of the components of the Luster, com uh, Luster file system. So lctldl is a command to view this. And uh, the main things we need to see that MGC, MDC, and OSCs are the connections to the Luster components. Uh, they're all up, so it's healthy. And let me view the status of the file system. Let me go forward a bit. Yep. Uh, LFSDFH gives you the uh, utilization of the Luster file system. Here we have two disks, uh, two 50 GB uh, disk, and the MDT is nothing but uh, the metadata file storage too. So we can view this status by LFSDFH command. So let me uh, switch to the Luster FS file system. Uh, I'll just create a file which has this content and uh, We'll log on to a different client and access the same file to ensure that the files are accessible. So that's done, and let me check the status, if it was successful. Yeah, it was successful. And let me come out of this client and go to the next client to see if I can access this file. So I'll get uh, the IP. Then log on to the Client two. Yep, uh, I was able to log on. And then uh, I'll view this file from the client two. It should say the same content which we had inputted earlier. So as you can see, I was able to access this file uh, from client two, and the Luster file system is successfully up. So let me go back to the presentation. Uh, so we did a basic benchmarking to see how the performance was. Uh, to stress that this is not at scale, we just used one M MGS, MDS, and OSS. So it may not reflect the real world scenario, but eventually uh, we wanted to see how the performance fares against the actual, MOS, uh, actual luster versus the Kubernetes infrastructure. Uh, to our surprise, uh, it was performing a little better than the actual luster file system because uh, we think the client and the storage servers were located in the same node. That's why probably there was ne less network chatter. So that's why the bandwidth was much better and the utilizations were much better. But we got to work more on this and finalize our results. But we just wanted to share this. I'll hand over. So the overall goal of this project was to make it easy and automated for a user to set up Luster. However, as you've seen throughout this demo, it's still anything but. And we still have some current limitations. For example, the Luster bootstrapping modifications are not too flexible, as any modifications have to be currently done through the secrets. We don't have any tolerance right now to local or to node failures. The local storage in the form of the PV claims are tied to individual nodes in the Kubernetes cluster. The MGS, MDS, and OSS are currently managed in separate YAML files, as this was easier for us to set up, but ideally this would all be in the same YAML script. And the reason for these limitations is that we were just graduate students with only a semester to work on this, and we did w what we could. To fix these current limitations, we want to look into storage um, orchestrator frameworks like Rook or Operator SDK. So we first looked into Rook, which is an open source cloud native storage um, orchestrator. It features automated deployment, bootstrapping, configuration, provisioning, scaling, disaster recovery, and more. 
It allows us to manage applications running inside Kubernetes using Kubernetes native tools, such as a YAML configuration instead of native Ceph or Lustre commands. And it keeps the underlying storage system, like Lustre, unaware of Kubernetes. However, what made Rook initially attractive to us, its widespread community support and maturity, also made it very cumbersome to deal with. And we found a lot of difficulty in figuring out how it worked and how to actually incorporate it. So we found an alternative tool called Operator SDK easier to work with. Rook and Operator SDK are similar. Um, they use what's called a reconcile loop, but Operator SDKs is much more easy to understand. So at any given point, you have two things. You have the YAML change spec and you have the current state. And at any given point, if there's a mismatch between the, with, between the spec and the state, the reconcile loop will determine what that mismatch is and reconcile and fix what the, it is. So an example would be, let's say our YAML spec requires 30, or now requires 36 OSS Lustre instances rather than 35. And let's say we currently have 35 OSS instances running. The reconcile loop in the operator SDK will spawn a 36th instance to match that spec and basically fix any difference. So what's next for us? Basically, we want to take these puzzle pieces that we've written and fit them together better. We want to provide more flexibility for bootstrapping Lustre, and we want to keep working with the operator SDK and exploring integration between it and Qvert. We'd like to thank our mentor, Dan, for his continued help, our, our professors, Peter and Aran, and we'd like to thank all of you for attending. Did anybody try this beside you? To our knowledge, no. Yeah. All right, that's the next step, I guess. <laughs> Did I misunderstand her? At the beginning, you said you needed to patch the kernel to deploy this, and that's why you ended up doing this with containers and? Yeah, I can take that. So basically, containers, uh, we needed to, Luster by default is not available on the Linux images, so we had to do some Luster uh, kernel patching to get Luster working. So Luster has certain specific kernel packages, which has been removed from the standard uh, Unix or Linux support. So that's why we needed to pass that first, and then get the image up and running, and then we needed to boot it into Kubernetes. Yeah. Uh, we, I had to do it for the server too. Yeah, there was nothing luster related at all when it dug, it, dug deeper into the image. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm still a little confused as to okay. how that fixes it for the container running. You don't have a kernel in the Oh, container. that was not related to content running. That was just to create an image that had pre-baked luster modules already. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you.